deception or evasion. We also have the notion of the assaults uh, on officers. Uh, but the reality is that I also talk about something that I call the power of talk. And this is why the government essentially criminalized talk uh, in the sense of if you talk to your neighbors in a way that was disparaging of the war effort or of the administration, uh, or if you were a newspaper editor uh, that essentially wrote an editorial condemning the war and encouraging people to oppose it, that kind of powerful talk was considered a form of opposition. Uh, and uh, it was universally acknowledged that that was some of the most difficult to curb because people talked all the time in their communities with the people around them. Uh, and so what you found is that uh, in many communities, these clusters of what we call these deserter countries, uh, they are formed because people begin to share similar opinions uh, that the war is unjust, the war is unwinnable, or other factors that seem uh, to, to indicate uh, failure in the long term. So uh, we talk about the power of talk as another form of opposition. But the reality is there were other ways in which the government recognized uh, forms of opposition. One of them uh, came through a form of organization that at the time was called mutual protection societies. Now, that's an unusual word, but essentially what it meant is that in local communities, Typically men who might be eligible for the draft might join uh, a club, a club of their own devising. Now, the way they might mutually protect each other depended on their inclination and their financial situations. Uh, in some clubs, they essentially pooled money together so that if someone were drafted, you might be able to buy your way out of the draft by paying commutation or hiring a substitute. So some of these mutual protection societies were a financial protection, perfectly legal uh, and not illegitimate. Uh, but other clubs, ones that did not represent the same resources and ones that had a sort of different personality in mind, their idea of protection might be that if one of them were drafted, the others would gang together to release them from the captivity of marshals. And since the, the federal draft was essentially administered uh, at the forefront by small numbers of marshals, uh, they could often be overpowered. They were in charge of vast areas of the North, and it was almost impossible for them to truly control events under their departments. And so uh, it was not unusual that in various regions across the North, marshals wrote in that they had been uh, uh, confronted by angry crowds of people and forced to release those that they had arrested, whether they were deserters or men who had been drafted. So mutual protection societies existed, uh, and in the area that I focused, uh, especially the, uh, the lumbering counties of the Appalachian region, uh, these were formed as well. Uh, and these were of the sort of more hard-shelled variety in which those men uh, relied upon their guns rather than their wallets. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, in uh, Clearfield County, those men created something they called the Democratic Castle. Rather unusual name. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, in fact, it was uh, assumed by uh, the Republicans that this castle actually had a genuine fort uh, that was their base of operations. Uh, and uh, the Democratic Castle seemed to have been uh, sort of a loosely organized grassroots effort in some communities throughout Clearfield County. Uh, and it is true that the government uh, did uh, uh, arrest some of those men and compel their testimony and uncover what they considered was the smoking gun of conspiracy in those communities. And so what it was really is proof that some people would band together to help each other against the reach of the government and might use uh, violence if necessary. In fact, some marshals were assaulted. Uh, and so we can definitely say that these mutual protection societies uh, did exist. Uh, but ultimately, I also want to stress that Republicans, they felt threatened in communities by these opponents of the war. In fact, Many Republicans in some of these deserter country areas, they complained to military authorities that they were under what they called a reign of terror, uh, that they were threatened and intimidated. Uh, some of them complained of having been vandalized or robbed. Uh, and uh, they essentially sought the protection of the federal government to come into their community, arrest the malcontents, uh, and bring peace and order back uh, to their uh, homes. And so what we see is that uh, this, uh, this perception uh, 
of, uh, of threat uh, or this reign of terror that supposedly existed in some communities was the thing which drove the federal government to use uh, authority, uh, the authority of soldiers on the home front. Uh, so ultimately, what I focused on was the notion uh, of how the federal government uh, tried to uh, essentially create expeditions of soldiers into areas that were considered difficult. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the government uh, spoke in terms of, uh, of conspiracy mindedness uh, that essentially local citizens in those disaffected areas were combining together. In fact, uh, let me read to you uh, an excerpt from a report uh, written by the man who was in charge of all of Western Pennsylvania to his superior in Washington, D.C. And it gives you some sense of, from his perspective, of the problem that he thought he was facing. Uh, the report says simply, uh, I am reliably informed that there are at this time from 1,200 to 1,800 deserters, delinquent drafted men, and disloyal citizens, armed and organized, engaged in lumbering on Clearfield River in Clearfield and Cambria counties. They are said to have a fort in Knox Township. Many outrages have been committed by these men. Uh, and he goes on, of course, to describe these outrages, the assault on officers, uh, as well as a statistic that in the recent draft, 660 names were pulled and 400 men did not report. Now, now it was true that uh, uh, across the Union, it was not unusual uh, that men did not report when drafted. In fact, the national average was something like 20% who were drafted would not show up when were, uh, they were supposed to. But there, in that particular area, because the power of talk in that community, uh, 400 people <laughs> out of 660, something like 60% uh, uh, decided uh, that they would uh, not report. So uh, we're talking about something that they considered a serious problem. Uh, and ultimately, uh, that was part of the reason uh, that they used to authorize expeditions into the lumber region. But uh, before I talk about the lumber region and some of the things that I think really make that region tick, let me just say briefly that the lumber region has its own set of causes, but there are other regions that are motivated by their own circumstances as well. Uh, some of those regions included, of course, uh, the border regions of the south, uh, the area of the southern border of Pennsylvania with ties across the border to the south, to southern kinsmen, economic ties, uh, and other things that connected them uh, to an identity uh, in the South, uh, we do find pockets of resistance there. We also find that in some communities there are things that we might call uh, class divisions or ethnic divisions, uh, especially among recent immigrants, as in New York City, where working class Irish immigrants felt disaffected or alienated from the Union cause uh, and from economic hardships might prefer not to serve. And so, just as in New York City, we find pockets of resistance in Pennsylvania that seem motivated by that, such as Irish miners in the hard coal region of the northeast part of Pennsylvania. So, ultimately, we can see similarities at work there. But uh, there are other things, too. Uh, we mentioned briefly before the notion that there are religious dissenters, that there are pockets of Anabaptist pacifists. Uh, Mennonites and Amish and Dunkards and others, uh, as well as the, the Quaker remnant in Pennsylvania society. Uh, and so their uh, opposition to the war comes from a different source entirely. Uh, and then ultimately, there are some areas that I refer to as regions of anarchy. Uh, and let me give you one good example of that. I think to some degree the lumber region would have seemed like a uh, region of anarchy to the federal authorities, but one region that really sticks out is what we would have called the oil region of the Northwest. Now, when we think of oil production in the United States, we probably often don't think of Pennsylvania first, except for Pennsylvanians uh, who might know that. Uh, and the reality is, though, that in the period just before the Civil War, Pennsylvania was the oil region of the United States. Uh, and uh, boom towns sprung up. And uh, young men from all over the country went to find their fortune in oil. And those regions were crazy. <laughs> they were like the Old West, where uh, law and order uh, were difficult to enforce. Uh, and uh, officials wrote about those regions uh, as regions of mobility uh, and regions of tough characters uh, and places in which it was difficult to enforce the draft. Uh, when men were in search of personal fortune, uh, then uh, they could simply pick up and move on uh, and, and very seldom be traced. 
So regions like that, uh, regions of anarchy, were another region. But I was compelled to understand why in the uh, end of the year 1864, after the elections that re-elected Abraham Lincoln, why did the U.S. government send a regiment of what was known as the Veteran Reserve Corps, the, the militant arm of the Provost Marshal's Bureau, stationed throughout the North? They essentially were the government's muscle. Uh, they were men who could no longer serve at the front, incapacitated by sickness or light wounds, and not yet discharged from duty. And the Veteran Reserve Corps were essentially the government's troops to enforce discipline. And so in the end of 1864, based on the report of Major Dodge, the Provost Marshal of Western Pennsylvania, uh, the government authorized him to send in companies of the Veteran Reserve Corps uh, to essentially administer shock and awe uh, in Clearfield County. And he spelled out his plan to subdue uh, opposition there and then move on to other disaffected regions and let that serve as an example of government authority for others. Uh, so ultimately, they authorized an expedition, partly mounted, partly uh, on foot, uh, into the uh, region to arrest those who had evaded the draft, uh, who had deserted from the army. So I wanted to know what made that region tick. Why was that Appalachian mountain region uh, so important? Uh, and uh, what I found is that, to some degree, uh, all the things we talked about in terms of the, the copperheads, the factors that included uh, economic factors, and opposition to the draft, and opposition to emancipation, uh, and uh, opposition to it as a war of coercion, uh, we see those things at, at work. But there was something else, and I wanted to read another segment of that report to see if you can't pick out that element that I think is crucial to that story. Um, it's in the same report that I just spoke about a few minutes ago. And he goes on to say, it is of the utmost importance that troops be moved against these people at once. First, very important, first, they will all vote for the opposition. First is the political reasons. They're going to vote for the Republicans, or the Democrats, sorry. Uh, and what's interesting is he numbers these. And the last reason, reason number five, is, of course, it is the, of, the, of the utmost importance to the preservation of peace and supremacies of the laws that such, such organizations be crushed immediately. So it's interesting that first comes political considerations, and last is preservation of peace and order. But what I was interested in was what came in the middle. And he went on to say, in a very short time, the roads will be impassable to troops, practical considerations. But third, many of their rafts are completed and only await the rise in the river to proceed to market. If the rise occurs before the troops reach there, many of these men will escape down the river on their rafts. Fourth, they are all dependent for the support of themselves and families upon the proceeds to be derived from the sale of these rafts. The fear of losing them will cause the disaffected citizens to lay down their arms and disavow and discontinue connection with the deserters. So I ask myself, what are rafters? And why are rafters at the core of opposition in Clearfield County, uh, which was considered nearly 2,000 strong? And what I found is that this story was a story unique to that region of Pennsylvania's Appalachians. Uh, that that was what we referred to as the lumber region. Even then, it was known as the lumbering region. In the 1850s, Pennsylvania was the leading producer of lumber in the nation. And for many of these farmers, what they were doing is in the off months of the agricultural season, they would work in the woods, felling trees, white pine, hemlocks, moving them to the rivers, and in the spring they would fashion them into rafts. Huge affairs that by the time they reached their markets might lengthen to 300 feet. And they'd have to be piloted down the rivers like the Susquehanna or the Allegheny or others. To them, this was an extension of agriculture. It was an extension of farming. It was the thing that allowed them to survive in the Appalachian Highlands, where farms were smaller, less productive, where they were what we might call hard scrabble farmers, where they were traditionally uh, a region of Democrats, people who were interested in limited government uh, and the rights of small farmers. So they were interested, they were motivated by a context of economic concerns for their region. But rafters were under attack in the 1850s. Their way of life was undermined. 
because in that decade, we also see the introduction of what I call industrial lumbering. Wealthy investors would purchase huge tracts of forest land. They would hire army 